Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Inflation rose more than expected last month to 0.6% according to the Office for National Statistics. It was pushed up by an increase in the cost of fuel and second-hand cars. Separate figures out today suggest the fall in the value of the pound since the UK's referendum vote to leave the EU has increased the cost of imports for manufacturers. Here's our economics correspondent Andy Verity. What's Brexit got to do with the price of fish? Now, this Chessington-based food importer the scale of the drop in the value of the pound is no joke. This would be about a 240 gram pack. We could probably produce a pack like this for somewhere around about four pounds a pack. Because the pound has fallen to a 30 year low, this firm needs more pounds to buy the same fish in dollars, euros or yen. These yellowfin tuna fish are an example of post-Brexit inflation. They come from the Western Pacific Ocean and they're priced in Japanese yen. Since Brexit, they're costing 16% more than they were before. That price rise will feed through to consumers starting as soon as next month. The cost to companies of raw materials had been falling, but in the year to July, they rose by 4.3%. Many companies like this one can't bear those higher costs alone, so they're already talking to their customers about raising prices. We made £3 million on £90 million, so we make 3% margin. Um, and the, the inflation uh, that we're likely to experience is roughly three and a half times the size of that profit. So clearly we have to re-engineer our offer, we have to pass on um, a big part of that inflation to our customers. At commuter stations today, rail passengers were warned of a fare rise next January based on an old measure of the cost of living, the Retail Prices Index, or RPI. That's gone up by 1.9%, more than three times as fast as the official measure, the Consumer Prices Index. Every single day you have problems and you take two, three hours on the train. That compared to the price that you pay to two together just makes you feel that it's not fair. This increase in particular isn't excessive, but if you add them all up, then they have gone up a lot, you know, way too much, I think. Everything goes up except the wages, of course, but uh, if they could keep it in proportion, I don't think anyone would mind a little, but no, I think it's unfair. The train companies say the extra money will be well spent. We're investing massive amounts of money, around a, a million pounds every hour uh, in the railway upgrade program, 50 billion pounds over the next few years, uh, and delivering uh, a huge number of new trains uh, to provide better and better services. More inflation, not just for rail passengers, but everyone, is something the Bank of England is trying to encourage by setting the official interest rate at a record low. But it wants the sort of inflation that goes with economic growth and higher wages, not the sort that makes life more expensive even as the economy slows down. Andy Verity, BBC News. Now, we were all offered today an early New Year present from the train companies, the promise of a 1.9% rise in prices next January. Of course, it came with a cast-iron guarantee of an improvement in all aspects of the service. Right, that last bit's not quite true, but we can live in hope. The rise tied to July's retail prices element of inflation will apply to what are called regulated fares in England, Scotland and Wales. That's about half of them, including season tickets. And funnily enough, quite a lot of passengers weren't too happy about the news today. As the industry was eager to show it remains value for money today, these were the scenes on some trains, with punctuality and satisfaction figures under pressure after months of strikes and disruption. And here are three long-suffering rail passengers, angry about strikes, overcrowding and prices. On the day new fares were announced, they kept video diaries. This is typical really that, um, you know, I'm starting my working day, having to stand on the train all ready, hot and bothered. Despite customers' discomfort, today's RPI inflation figure of 1.9% is used to set fair rises. The increase takes a season ticket from Birmingham to London up £190 to £10,202. An annual fare from Newcastle to Leeds will go up £140 to £7,520. And a season ticket from Wrexham to Cardiff will increase by £141 to £7,605 starting in January. Strikes have been terrible, um, had to get hotel, taxis, 
spend about £350 last week. We're all paying customers and uh, if I treated my customers like that I wouldn't have a job so you know, I think a lot of people are getting extremely angry. The price rises announced today are pegged to inflation but the unions have released new research claiming that fares have increased at double the speed of wages since 2010. Fares are going to rise today by almost 2% and bearing in mind the fact that I paid £397 today for my ticket, um, I think that's pretty steep. I lose track of the number of times when in the summer uh, the carriages are stiflingly hot because the air conditioning isn't working. Every time fares go up, your industry promises better trains, better performance, never happens. I don't think that's correct. Um, over many, many years, uh, there has been underinvestment, decades of underinvestment, which we're now putting right. I actually look back at the record, and exactly four years ago, when prices went up, you made the same promises, but we didn't get better trains, did we? The performance isn't good enough. The well, performance on parts of the railway is not as we would like it to be, that's absolutely clear. Um, and there are challenges about growing the railway. Heading home tonight, many rail users want more than promises in return for higher fares. And though improvements are coming, some will take years. Chris Choi, News at 10. So the frustration of many passengers, clear enough there. But what is the answer apart from gritting our teeth and bearing it? Nationalisation, say some, including the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn, for whom it's a long-held policy priority. He said today it wouldn't be so expensive once the current operating franchises ran out. From 1948 until the mid-90s, Britain's railways were publicly owned. Although they eventually became known for strikes, cancellations and bad sandwiches, there are those who think renationalising the railways now would improve them. So how much would it cost? Well, the rail network is already publicly owned. The operating companies are private, but their franchises have to be renewed. So the Labour leader says renationalisation might not be very expensive. The cost would be not very much because in fact we'd be taking over the franchises as they ran out and hand them over to direct rail to run as, it, as train companies. But how long would that take? The old British Rail headquarters is now a hotel and Jeremy Corbyn will find it difficult to return to its glory days easily because of the 15 rail franchises only five are up for grabs in the next parliament when he hopes to be in power. The other contracts either already have or by that time are likely to have end dates stretching into the 2020s and beyond. But even if it could be done, would it make any difference anyway? Well, perhaps not to fares. We've calculated that in the UK a 20 mile off peak journey into the capital costs on average £9. In Germany, where the railways are largely nationalised, a similar fare costs the equivalent of £5.10. But in France, where they're almost entirely nationalised, it's £6. The truth is that fares are determined by levels of subsidy, not ownership. And Mark Smith, who once worked for British Rail, sees other disadvantages to renationalisation. Well, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we thought that repainting the trains a different colour would suddenly make everything run on time. And I think we'd also be fooling ourselves if we thought that fares would suddenly become cheaper because the mathematics is the same whether the trains are blue and grey or red, white and blue. The danger is that we would lose some of the private sector innovation and investment over and above what BR could or would have done that has led to improved services and increased passengers. So today's commuters may not find much comfort in a renationalised railway, which in any event would be a slow train coming. Carl Dinham, News at 10. And there is a guide to how the cost of your season ticket might rise on our website. If you are a regular rail passenger, find out what the damage will be at itv.com news. Or possibly don't bother if you've had a nice evening to date. Um, now, the rise in rail prices is, as we said, linked to July's inflation figures, which were up on the previous month. The first guide to what the post-Brexit fall in the value of the pound might be doing to our cost of living. Our economics editor, Narina Hertz, is here to talk about it. Narina, I mean, a pretty small rise today, and tiny in fact, but that's not necessarily the whole story, is it? Yeah, you're right. We've seen a pretty insignificant rise in consumer price inflation. Mm -hmm. But that's because the plummeting pound hasn't yet translated into higher 
prices in the high street because retailers and manufacturers typically take a number of months to adjust mm. their prices. So the real figure we should be focusing on right now, if we want to get a sense of where prices are heading, is a different measure of inflation. It's the producer price index. Mm. And this tracks the prices that manufacturers pay um, for the materials that they buy. And if we look at that index, we actually see a very different story because those prices, the prices that manufacturers pay for materials, went up by 4.3% in July. And that's largely because the price of imported materials, such as oil mm. and metals, went up at the fastest rate that we've seen in five years. So when manufacturers do put their increased costs on the shoulders of consumers, and when retailers also adjust their prices to fully take into account the weak pound, well, then we will see prices go okay. up. Nearly 5% sounds a lot, it has to be said. Are we, therefore, in your view, guaranteed a pretty severe bout of inflation at this point? And if so, how bad realistically might it be? Well, I've seen estimates that inflation could reach over 3% mm. next year, although the Bank of England's estimates are less gloomy. But the reality is that if we see any significant rise in inflation, it will be felt because wages will not go up at a corresponding rate and yet our cost of living would go up. OK, I suspect we will be back uh, and back to this. Uh, but for now, at least, Narina, thank you very much indeed. Now, are you too fed up with late, overcrowded and unreliable trains? Well, now that nightmare journey is going to cost even more as regulated train fares go up by 1.9% throughout the country next year. It's part of rising transport costs across the board. Motor fuel and second-hand car prices helped to drive up last month's inflation to 0.6%, higher than expected. But it's embattled commuters who are feeling especially hard done by, as Paul McNamara has been finding out. 7.30 on Southern Rail and an all-too-familiar announcement. It wasn't the long-running dispute between unions and Southern Rail causing the crush, but a minor derailment. The same standing room only result, though, for hundreds of passengers. And this just hours before finding out that they face a ticket price hike of nearly 2%. Is this value for money? Well, I'm not too sure some of the passengers packed up against the loo on this sudden service would agree. Of course we resent fare increases, train, but I wouldn't mind if we had more services and more comfortable trains. We are now approaching you know, potentially longer trains junction. where people could actually travel um, in some comfort, or at least the front, the front, the front, cap off. Um, you know, you pay for someone, you expect a service. You wouldn't get this anywhere else. And actually, anywhere else, anyone who ran a business like this would have certainly gone under by now. I pay 1,540 annually, and um, that's because it's annual ticket. So you can imagine paying 1,540 and you, you, this is all you get, or even worse. <laughs> this morning, it was announced that the retail price index level of inflation for July rose to 1.9% and July's RPI rate sets the cap for how much season tickets and popular fares can be increased by across the country. So what's this increase actually likely to cost you? Well, if you get the train every day from here in Greater London to the city centre, next year your annual fare could be an extra £40. From Huddersfield to Leeds, it's likely to cost you an extra £25. And if you get the train from Reading to London every day, next year your fare could be an extra £100. Big enough, you might think. But according to the TUC, fares on peak routes have gone up by 25% since just 2010. The rail industry says with no more money forthcoming from the government, standards will only rise if prices do too. Nobody wants to pay more in fares. As a passenger, I don't want to pay more in fares. Uh, but as a taxpayer, I also want to make sure that I get the best uh, use out of taxpayers' money that goes into the railway. Government has to make a choice. It makes a choice about the balance between how much fare payers pay and how much taxpayers pay. Our job in the industry is to deliver the best possible service for that money that's available. This man thinks he has the solution. Jeremy Corbyn joined rail unions for a rally today before refusing a first-class ticket to make his case from the floor of a packed train to Newcastle. The reality is there's not enough trains, we need more of them, and they're also incredibly expensive. Isn't that a good case for public ownership? Whatever the solution, it's a long way off. In the short term, though, more delays ahead, as union members for the RMT voted today in favour of strikes. 
against the closure of ticket offices at 83 stations. And which lines will be affected? Well, back to those we started the day with, long-suffering commuters of Thameslink and Southern Railways. Well, at least Jeremy Corbyn got a seat there in Paul McNamara's report. So, Corbyn wants the railways to be re-nationalised. Would that be a good thing? Kat Hobbs is the founder of We Own It, which campaigns for public services to be in public hands. Also here, Alex Wilde, who is research director for the Taxpayers Alliance. Welcome to you both. Alex Wilde, if I can start with you, I take the train most days to work. It's a mercifully short journey of 20 minutes, but it's miserable. I'm standing up, it's overcrowded, it's stuffy, it's mostly late. It is an utterly unpleasant beginning to my day. So, why not nationalise them? Well, the question is, why is it overcrowded and, and all of that, and why is it late? And the reasons that it's overcrowded and late are not related to the fact that it's private rather than public sector. I mean, if you think well, about... Why what, not? Well, why, why is it overcrowded? That's because we have fares that are extremely highly regulated. I mean, for instance, I travel back to Birmingham quite, quite regularly from London. If I get a train at five to seven, it's about £200. If I get a train at about five past seven, it's about £50. We have a ridiculous fare structure where it suddenly drops off a cliff and everyone piles into the cheapest train where the fares are really heavily capped. I think we need a much more flexible fare system where prices sort of decline as demand declines. I sent my entire family, six of us, from Berlin to Salzburg last winter. It's an eight-hour journey. I have to say we went first class. You know what it cost me? 210 euros for the entire family. Don't tell me that they're cheap here this at any time. This, this whole thing is a trade-off, as Mr Plummer was, was just saying. Either the passengers pay or the taxpayers pay. And the European systems that you're talking to, whilst they deliver low fares, they're extremely expensive uh, for taxpayers. So it's the German taxpayer who's picking up the bill for that, which is all very well for you, but not so great for Germans. OK. Um, what do you say to that, then? So... Well, this is being pitched as between passengers and taxpayers, but mm. actually, what about the shareholders? Research shows that if we brought the railways into public ownership, we would save £1.2 billion a year, and that's more than enough to reduce fares or invest more in capacity. We could reduce fares by 18% if we brought the railways into public ownership. But is that really going to happen? I know that's the promise. Is that actually going to happen? Well, a reduction of 18%? We can only save money by bringing the railways into public ownership. Right now, we're wasting money on shareholders. It's not efficient. We can have an integrated network that is better run, more efficient, less fragmentation, and less profits going out to shareholders. That sounds great in theory, but I remember the last time it was called British Rail, it was even worse than what we had now, a lot worse, in fact. So how... What guarantees can you give me that it would be any better than the last time that the railways were nationalised here? Well, I think it's really important that we don't talk about going backwards. What we need is a railway that's fit for the future. So this isn't about British Rail. It's about having a railway that's accountable to the passengers who use it as well as to the taxpayer. So what's your model? Which, which, where does it work? In which country? So, for example, it worked right here in this country when the government took over the East Coast Line between yeah. 2009 and 2014 and returned £1 billion to the Treasury in that time, saving money for the passenger and the taxpayer. Well, there you go. How can you argue with that? Well, the, the thing is, if you look at nationalised industries, the problems with them tend to manifest themselves over a much longer, much larger time period. So whilst that railway net, well, it has been reasonably successful, you'd expect to start seeing the same problems that we have with all nationalised industries. I mean, you know, if you look at... Let's look at passenger satisfaction. It's around 80% at the moment. What was it under British Rail? We don't know. They didn't bother recording it. That's how much they cared about passengers. But with, you know, the mounting incidents of strikes, the, the, the cost, the overcrowding, the lateness, what is, is there anything good about trains in this country? Well, I think we have to be realistic. I mean, by, our trains are by no means the worst in Europe. I mean, they're so actually what, what's, extremely what's the, safe. OK, what's the yardstick here? Who are you comparing us to? Well, if you look at something... Bulgaria, like... Romania? No, I mean, just... They're all, there's no one-size-fits-all model that, that works, but we have to understand that this is fundamentally a trade-off, and we can have lots and lots of taxpayer subsidy to commuters who are typically better off than the average person, or we can have you know, higher fares. That's, there is no free money here. Is there not a halfway house where, basically, we have um, part ownership um, by the public or part privatisation? You have the public, the greatest stakeholder in railways, but at the same time, you've got private incentives, company corporate incentives, to create some degree of competition. 
Well, I don't know why we're trying to pretend that the railway is about competition. I mean, if you think of a poor commuter trying to take a southern rail train this morning, what choice do they have? They don't have a choice. So railways aren't the kind of public service, the kind of economic good where it makes sense to try and create a market. And that's why 66% of people want to see the railways in public ownership. That is the fundamental truth, isn't it? You can't really have competition. I don't turn up at my station and say, am I going to take southern rail or southeastern rail or whatever? There's basically one train service that goes through my station and that's what I'm landed with. Well, there are some routes where there's some... some but not very many. ...although it's very complicated. But, but it's what a minority. We, you know, we're competing against roads and who's really being ripped off here? I mean, you've got subsidised fares with no VAT, but then you've got motorists paying fuel duty... Uh, we're changing the subject onto duty. roads now. Well, you know, motorists are the ones who are being ripped off here, not rail passengers. OK, we've got to leave it there. Alex Wild, Cat Hobbs, thank you very much indeed. I've been getting away